my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a few.
KCLC, Happy New Year. We made it through 2020. Here's hoping 2021 is a little less chaotic. Looking forward to see what God has in store for us. I'm Roxana, and these are this week's announcements. Just a reminder that due to provincial-wide lockdown, there will be no in-person services, and we will be continuing to have services online until further notice. That being said, the church is closed to the public until further notice, and all staff will be working from home until we are cleared by the government to do otherwise. If you need to reach any of us, please contact us by email using our first name at christianlifecenter.ca and we will get back to you at our earliest convenience. Also, because we aren't sure when we'll be allowed back together in person or what the new guidelines might look like, we unfortunately have to cancel our upcoming water baptism class and service until further notice. If you're wanting to give your regular tithes and offerings, you can do so by texting the word GIVE to 905-686-1411, by visiting our website www.christianlifecenter.ca under donation, by sending us an email money transfer to life at christianlifecenter.ca, by mailing in a check to 1030 Ravenscroft Road, Ajax, Ontario, L1T 4R9, or by dropping it off in the mailbox at the front entrance. However you choose to give, we want to say thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. We also want to encourage you to follow us on Instagram or Facebook by going to those websites and searching for at Discover CLC. You can also send us an email to life at christianlifecenter.ca if you'd like to be added to our weekly email updates. Any new updates or announcements will be given through one of these methods, so please find a way to stay plugged in and connected. That's all I've got for you this week. I'm Roxana, and those were this week's announcements. Enjoy the rest of service. Greetings, Chuck Price from Reapers in the Rain International. I trust you're well. It's a great season to be alive in spite of what's taking place in our lives. It's a season of reflection. It's a season of hope in the new year, what will come our way. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. I uh, a caution in my own heart as I get older, maybe for us who have crossed that 60 marker, is that we don't get stuck on memory lane. We don't get stuck in the past. We want to be relevant and continue to move forward to the future. So that's really what I want to talk to you about today is don't get stuck on memory lane. And uh, I'm going to read from Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 3, uh, looking at verses 7 to 14. And uh, I want, really want to address, though, in verses 12, 13, and 14, that Paul he echoes those thoughts a few times, uh, the things that he considers profitable in his own life, and what he considers after a period of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He's looking back and going, this is, this is, all, this is all nothing, this is all dung, this is all just waste. But really what I want to do is get to know God, got to get to know Jesus Christ. And now in verse 12, he reaches this point, not that I've already obtained all this. I haven't arrived. Uh, I'm not perfect or have already been made perfect, but I press on and take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's where we'll end our reading today. And I want to use this as a platform to just share five thoughts with you today and just open your heart to what the Word of God has to say. I don't think it's wrong to look back and to, uh, to have memories and to uh, reminisce over things uh, from the past. In fact, the Bible talks about remembering. And probably three of the most popular verses that would come to our attention is Psalm 103, verse 2, forget not all thy benefits. And it's a great insurance package we have in Psalm 103. But we don't want to forget all the benefits that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Deuteronomy 15, 15, that's a, one of the life verses for me, probably one of the first texts that I've ever preached on in Bible college, was that we would remember this. Remember that we used to be a bondman in Egypt, but our Redeemer set us free. We used to be slaves in sin, but we have a Redeemer in Jesus Christ, Jehovah God. Then, of course, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. do this in remembrance of me. 
do this in remembrance of me as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do it in remembrance of him until he comes again. So there are some great moments where we need to remember and reflect from the word of God. So there's many scriptural forget-me-nots. It's in the word of God. It's there for us. I understand that. So it's not a bad thing to go down memory lane to take a journey once in a while. It's not bad. Maybe it helps us face tomorrow or, or uh, help shape our, our future. Maybe, maybe to take inventory of the past to see what's worked, what hasn't worked. However, however, I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to stay there. That's not my heart. That's not my passion is to stay in the past. Uh, memory lane once in a while, okay, but not to live there, not to live there. And so we can either get hung up on the good or the bad. We can talk about all the good times. We can talk about all the bad times. And not a bad thing, but we're not going to live there. We're not going to stay there. We can get stuck there. Some people, they live their lives in the past. I think it was, I don't know who it was. I give them credit, but I don't remember. Someone has said it this way. Be inspired by history, but don't get trapped by it. Don't get trapped by it. Don't live there. I think those are good words. Many people like to avoid the present. If they could, they would just like to avoid the present by living in the past. So actually they could live in the past or live in the future. Uh, to do either, to, to do either really is to miss the now of what God has for our life. Because there are now moments. Hebrews 11.1, 1, there's a now faith moment. That's, that's how we operate. Now faith, now faith, not past faith. That's why the word of God says that it cometh by hearing. Hearing, heareth coming, it, it, it's, it's ours. Hearing is an active present word. It's not past tense. I appreciate what you heard last week, but there's an active word today in present, in hearing. I think you understand that. Other people, they, 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 just, they just avoid it. Some people live in the past, they cling to it. They just hang right on to it. And so that's where they live. They don't want to live in the, in the future. They don't want to live in the present. To them, the best days are behind them. Nothing's going to change. In fact, it's going to get worse. And I don't want to be one of those. I don't want to live there. Sometimes it's more comfortable to live in the past. It's just more comfortable to, to, to be around the familiar, the well-worn, the tried, and that's where we stay, the broken in, the broken in. You probably heard someone, they open the fridge and say, there's nothing in it. Well, the, the fridge is packed with food. Or they go into your, the closet and go, I have nothing to wear. But on every hanger, there's a, a pair of pants, a shirt, or a dress, or a blouse. Or It's just they don't have the familiar. They don't have, you know, the six pieces of articles of clothing that they enjoy wearing. But there's lots there. The Apostle Paul really addresses that issue in this portion of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3. The whole, the whole theme of his passage is leaving the past, pressing on to the present, the future glories and triumphs, especially in verse 13. That at some point we need to forget Forget, forget. There's got to be a forgetting that is be and, and what is behind and strain, press towards what is ahead. Now, there are some things we need to leave behind. It's, it's true. We need to leave behind some things and pursue others. I get that. There's others that just spin their tires, their spiritual tires, never living up to their plan or their purpose or their potential. And so I want to look at five areas today that the Apostle Paul, I believe, would bring to our attention through the word that we need to address today. Number one is leave behind our past defeats and our failures. Leave behind things that, are, that have the potential to destroy you or you can pass on to others. We don't want that in this generation. And so leave behind our past defeats and failures. Some people, they wallow in the past. It's always, they're just a negative person, a negative attitude. They just can't get beyond them. I just think in 2021, we need to move forward, not shackling ourselves with our past. We've all had defeats. You know, we've all had moments where we've failed. I get it. I get it. I understand that. I've been there. I've done that. I got the scars. But I don't live there. It's not going to shape my future. It's not going to frame my future. That's not what God wants for you, and that's not what God wants for me. Pride says, I failed. I failed. I quit. I can't do it. I'll never try again. I'm just a failure. No, I don't buy that. Humility says, I I'll try again. I can do better. I can succeed in the days that lie ahead. God wants us to be successful. Now, I say that understanding that man's success is one thing and God's success is the other. When we stand before God someday, we're going to stand and he's going to address the successes of our life, not through man's eyes, not through an organization, not through a company, but through God's eyes, through God's heart, God's purposes and God's wills. So I believe that humility, humility can give us that push that we need today to move forward in the power of God. God wants us to be successful. Winston Churchill, he returned to speak at his former boys' school at Eton. The staff and the students waited with anticipation to hear his, this great orator's speech. Churchill got up and he said these words, 
Never give up. Never, never, never give up. Eight words, and he sat down. That was the length of his speech. Eight words, and he sat down. The impact of those words for a man who had risen from ashes of defeat to great prominence would never be forgotten by those boys. You see, if you understand his early years, he was a failure in school. His teachers thought he would go nowhere in life. Even in his early life in political office, you know, he simply just failed in every, every election until he turned 62 and became prime minister. And so we don't, we don't take a picture of his life and decide whether he's a success or whether he's a failure. Moses, remember the first time he tried to be a leader? He killed an Egyptian. It's, I read a lot of Maxwell, and that's not, one of, that's not a great quality in leadership, is to come into town and kill somebody. That just, that just doesn't work. But he didn't give up. Forty years later, he comes back in and becomes a great leader that we know about today. And I say, thank God. All the great men, women and, and, and men of Old Testament went through times of discouragement, went through times of defeat. You read their stories. That's what I love about the Word of God. It's real. It just lays it out there for the good, the bad, the ugly. David. David messed up big time. You know his story. Abraham lied. Uh, David was an adulterer. Samson, man, he had some weaknesses. But God used him and the Holy Spirit moved upon him. Peter, in New Testament, he was very impulsive, got himself into trouble a whole lot. He was a liar. He could even say to a little girl that he knew Jesus Christ. And so these men, these men that we look at in the Word of God, let's not put them up on pedestals. They're men like you and I, Elijah, Elisha. And I say thank God for their testimony in their good days and their bad days. I was thinking too about Abraham Lincoln. You know, he went bankrupt at 29. He was cheated by his partner, spent 15 years trying to get out of debt. His fiance died, leaving him depressed and almost suicidal. It went into politics, won the first time, then lost the next three straight elections. But he kept trying. He never gave up, eventually becoming one of the greatest presidents of the United States of America. So we don't quit. We don't quit. Too many quit. Too many decide they can't do it. They spend their lives on what could have been, what should have been, but it's not going to be. If I only had the breaks that other person got, don't, don't go down that road. Rise up, get up today, and let's be what God wants us to be. Baseball, Babe Ruth, hit 714 home runs, and we all applaud that. Wow, 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 wow. Expensive baseball card to have in your collection. 714 home runs. What they don't publicize is that he had 1,330 strikeouts. We talk about his home runs, and of course we do. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb and a countless others, but had so many failures. So many failures. I think with Dr. Zeus and all the books he had written. Do you know when he first started out, his first writing, his first book, was rejected by 27 different publishers? 27 different publishers. If he would have laid back, no, he didn't. And so I want to encourage you today, in a difficult season, and it may be a difficult time in your life, that God's not done with us. And I say, thank God. Pride says, everybody saw me fail. Philippians 4.13, humility says, I'll try again because I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. It's the same in, in spiritual failures and defeats. I've tried before. I can't make it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. He's able to complete what he started. Remember Joshua and Caleb? It took them 40 years to come back. But they finally did what was really needed. The first time they were defeated by others who had a bad report, but they had a good report. But they didn't give up. They paid the price, and 40 years later, they were able to walk into the promised land. I'm just telling you today that you and Jesus are still a majority. Don't give up. Number two, leave behind your past disappointments and disillusionments. Don't, don't, don't go down that road too often. We've all had disappointments. We've all had disappointments. We've all been disillusioned by situations or people. I'm thinking particularly in the area of dealing with people, that people make promises and we're disappointed. They make pledges and they're there for you, then they're gone. And, and I, you say, but I've been let down. I put my faith in this person and they let me down. They failed me. I understand that. I've failed people too, and people have failed me. I get that. I thought he was a Christian. I've heard that phrase in pastoring. I thought he was a Christian. I thought I could trust him. And I found out later that he was weakened in his Christianity and has devastated me. Or, or the hypocrites. I'm so disillusioned with the church. And, or I trusted her. Or broken expectations. Listen, so, some people, some, some hold the past against people forever and ever. They'll never trust again. We become cynical. We become negative. And we'll never accomplish what God has called us to do. Not with that kind of attitude. Understand that. I know we know these things. It's just a gentle reminder this season that God's still in control. Here's where I want you to live. Get your eyes off people. 
That's not your measuring stick anyway. Your measuring stick is to be like Jesus. My measuring stick is to be like Jesus. Get your eyes off people because at times we will let you down. Let's get our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can fail to forget past griefs and sorrows. It's important that we grieve over loss. Grief is important. You know, whether you've studied the five stages or six stages, uh, I'm just telling you it's important to grieve. Process it and move on. There comes a time where you have to put a period on that area of your life and move on. Life moves on. Holy Spirit moves on. God has a plan. God has a purpose for your life. And so we need to move with him. When God would move in Old Testament with the Israelites, he didn't run through a committee. He didn't ask. He just said, listen, the cloud is moving. The pillar of fire is moving. Are you coming? Are you coming? That's where he lived. That's what he promised us. And we need to move because the Holy Spirit's on a timetable. Also in the area of circumstances with disappointments and being disillusioned. Circumstances. We, we failed to get the promised promotion. We, we failed in a, in a job and the, they promised us we're crushed by loss in business or a loved one. A loved one. You pray and you call on God and still bad things happen. And the family's in a mess and you pray and pray and, and nothing it seems happens in the natural. I understand that. I understand that. We don't give up. We don't give up. We continue on in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If life has dealt you a disappointment, you can turn your, your adversity into a triumph. You can do that. You can do that. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process, but walking with God in faith is a process, growing your faith, maturing in God, in the good things of God. The third thing I'd like to share with you is this, leave behind your past mistakes or sins. And I phrase it that way, because not everything we do bad is, is sin. Paul talks about it's not expedient for you, it's not good for you. If all I did was drink Coca-Cola and ate chocolate every day, it's not a sin, but it's not expedient for my body. It's not good for me. It's not sin. It's just not good for me. So understand there are mistakes in life and there are sins in life. It's important you understand that. It's important we confess our sins and our mistakes and ask God to forgive us and we repent. I'm not here to minimize sin. That's not where I live. I, I still believe in repentance. I thank God for grace. I thank God for grace, but grace is not a standalone, standalone idea. It usually cuddles up with something called faith or, or hope, or, or, and that's how that works. And so I understand that. And so we need to come to God and ask God to, I repent, I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up. It's okay. It's not a bad word. It's a good word. I think that just opens the door for us to move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a time for guilt. There's a time for remorse. There's a few moments and, and we're not to let it fester and grow bigger and that's not where we live. So there's a moment, there's a time for that, but there's also a time to move forward. You cannot live under a cloud of guilt and past mistakes and sin and just live that way and really be the person God wants you to be. You can do Christianity. You can do ministry. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about being what God wants you to be, being who God wants you to be. That's what God wants you to be, a human being that serves him with your whole heart. Jesus will only bring those things to your mind that are not under the blood. If it's not under the blood, then it'll pop into your mind. Then there's the other one, the accuser of the brethren, who bring things back, and it's, it's false guilt. I, see, I can ask God to forgive me. The devil doesn't buy into that. He wants to beat me down. He wants to bring things into my mind. He's the prince of the air. He moves. He drops thought. Not every thought you have is yours. Please don't take ownership of every thought you have. There's a supplanter. He puts things into your mind. Just practice these three E's. Right? Enter, entertain, exit. Get out. You're not my thought because you don't look like Jesus and I want to be like Jesus. Repentance is the key to solving guilt. Repent and move on. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We need to make sure that we're in Christ, not hanging around Christ, but in Christ because there's no condemnation. That Listen, condemnation is not your friend. Conviction is. I thank God for convicting me. Conviction is my friend. Conviction has probably saved my life many times over the years where it could have gone crazier than it really was. Conviction, that voice, you call it moral compass or grandma's prayers, I call him Holy Spirit, hallelujah. He lives inside of you from the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ. And so we say, thank God. Guilt festers and it produces a sin cycle and on it goes and on it goes. And we need to get underneath the blood, hallelujah. You know what, church, you've not been disqualified because of your past. 
You've not been disqualified because of your sin. You've not been disqualified. God still loves you and God wants to use you. Amen. The fourth thing I want to share with you today is leave behind your past hurts. Leave behind your past hurts and pain. Leave them behind. Don't live there. Do not live there. Because hurt people hurt. Wounded people wound. And we don't want to act like that. We want to be that kind of Christian. We really don't. We, we need to be willing to forgive and to love again. It's one thing to say, well, I forgive you. But are you willing to love that person again? Two part. I, loving and forgiving, forgiving and loving. Some live in the bitterness and the resentment, uh, crippled spiritually and emotionally, psychologically crippled because in their mind, they're still walking in unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a, a, a door that you need to put a key into and unlock it and walk through to forgiveness that will open up your future, not only for you, but for those around you. You know, hatred is a prolonged form of suicide. You're just killing yourself. It affects you and your body. It affects you on so many different levels. It'll rob you of life, and that's not what God wants. So hatred is not our friend. The worst thing you can do to your enemies is love them. That's what the Bible teaches. I think you know that. The wrongs and hurts inflicted upon us, you know, we're going to be wronged. There's going to be hurt, and sometimes, unfortunately, it's intentional. Some will actually go out of their way to assassinate your character. They'll actually go out of their way to hurt you, to say something about you. And it stings and it hurts. So here's your choice. Forgive or hold on. Forgive or remember. Forgive, forgive, or just stay in that pattern where it cycles itself and gets bigger and bigger. And I've heard this so many times when I was pastoring. But pastor, you don't know what they did to me. You don't understand. You never walked in my shoes. And all that's may be true, may be true. But I'm not here to share stories with you so you feel better about yourself. I'm here to get to the root cause and get that out of your life so you can make room for the greatness of God in your heart and your life. We've all been hurt. You don't understand. You don't understand what they did. Again, here's the choice, church. Bitterness or sweetness? Bitter or get better? It's one or the other. You cannot live in both of these. You cannot, you cannot drink from the cup of bitterness and you can't drink from the cup that's sweet. It's got to be one or the other. I prefer that as we move forward, we move forward that we drink the sweetness of what God has for our life. Self-pity or freedom? Right? Resentment, anger, or joy and peace? Those are choices that we need to make today. Forgive, let it go. Forgiveness creates a new beginning for both parties. I say thank God. So many times we're slow to forgive. See, human nature, we're slow to forgive. Some do better than others. I understand that. But human nature seems to be slow to forgive. Is there any act too great to be forgiven? I'll tell you where I live. You cannot hurt me to the point that I've hurt Jesus Christ. You cannot, you cannot hurt me to the point that I've hurt Jesus Christ. And since he has forgiven me and I desire to be like him, because he lives inside of me and he's done more for me than anyone else on the planet or outside. You cannot hurt me to the point that I can't forgive you. Because Jesus Christ has forgiven me, I need to forgive you, period. Not bring it up, not this is just information, oh, just so you can pray, I'm, I'm not going down that road. We release it, we let it go, and by doing that, we make more room now for the fruit of the Holy Spirit to operate in our hearts and our lives. We need a revival of forgiveness. We really do. We've been around long enough as a movement, we've been around long enough on this planet that you know people have offended, people have hurt. I understand, I get it. We need a revival of forgiveness in our hearts and in our lives. If Stephen could do it, in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, Lord, lay not this sin against their charge. If Jesus could do it, in Luke 23, 24, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they don't have a clue what they're doing. Some do. It still hurts. I get it. Life is made up of choices choices. You're blessed by your choices or you're cursed by your choices. Don't blame the devil. Don't, don't blame somebody else. Action and reaction. And so you're accountable for your reaction. And I would just speak words of life. It's either life or death. We choose that. We, we choose that. Take ownership. Take responsibility of our action today as we choose going forward in the power of God. Forget. Forget the past hurts. I was abused as a, as a child. I was neglected, un unloved, a broken home. Listen, God's a great healer. 
God's a great healer. He can take care of that. It's a choice to be a victim or to live in victory. To be quite honest, I have a few years, years ago in, in social work as an educator in Montreal, and I've got to tell you, my thought is we've all been abused. If you've lived more than three weeks on the planet, you've probably been abused. All right? We might not be, not, not be sexually, might not be physically, could be religiously, could be verbally, but I guarantee every one of us have an abuse story somewhere in our past. It will not frame my future. It will not frame my future. I'm not going to do that. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit is going to frame my future in the days to come. So make a choice today. It's yours. It's yours to make. Victim, you want to be a victim? You can play that card. If you want to rise up today and be victorious, you can step forward and be that also. Thank God. Unanswered questions of the past. You ever had some why God moments? Why God? Why God? I, I stunted my Christianity. I stunted my prayer life for seven years with why God? With some family situations and the death of my father when I was 16. I, I, I stunted. I mean, I, I walked away from God and there was a few years where I shook my fist at God. But even that period, why God? Why God? Even coming back to God and moving on into Bible college and, and getting ready for ministry. My prayer life was stunted by why, 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 why? I had to learn, and God spoke to me one night and said, Chuck, do you want to know why, or do you want my presence? 24 hours later, I came back into that same room and said, God, I don't want to know why. And I'd added to the list by then of things that I had questioned. I need your presence. Listen, I want you to hear me this morning. The power is not in the why. The power is in the will. It's in the will of God to bring wholeness and health, not just into your body, not into your, into your mind, into your body, but through your whole family, into this generation. We, the church, hold the key to what God wants to bring peace in this generation. Unanswered prayers, what do you do with those? You prayed and you say, God, where were you? Where were you? Where were you? Listen, you, you don't judge spiritual success by one picture. In fact, you don't judge spiritual success with your eyes or you're just your simple mind. It has to be discerned by the Spirit by the Spirit. And I'm afraid sometimes we've been too quick to judge God when we only have one piece, one little picture, one little piece of the puzzle when God's still working things out on our behalf. On scene, on scene. In fairness, let's give God opportunity to complete the picture. Forgiveness is a willingness to walk beyond the hurt to a new understanding. It doesn't necessarily take away the hurt, but it refuses to allow the hurt to stand in the way of a new start. My last thought, my fifth thought is this. Leave behind your past glories and victories. Leave behind, leave them behind and seek something new. Seek something new. Be looking, the Bible talks about from victory to victory, not from defeat to defeat. And so we're going to Thank you, Lord, for past victories. Thank you for victory. Thank you for the past glories. But I'm not living there. I'm not setting camp up at Jericho. I'm not setting camp up just inside the promised land. I'm not hanging out at Gilgal. I'm going to continue to move forward in Jesus' name. You know, I want you to understand that. Get that into your heart. Okay, we're going to reminisce. We're going to thank God for the blessings, but I'm not going to live there. I will not live there. I am determined as I get older to stay in the present moment, in the now faith of my relationship with God. I don't want to be an old guy, 100 years of old, sitting on my rocker or off my rocker, going, boy, remember back, remember when, remember when. I want to be active in the presence of God. I, I deliberately seek that in my mind and my heart when, we've, when I'm around people and we're talking about the good old days. Listen, I've been on the planet now for over six decades. Some of them were good days, some were not. It's amazing how we remember things through rose-colored glasses. I don't know if you ever had the experience of going back to your grade 12 reunion after you know, your 40th and you remember people as they were when they were 17, 18, then you walk into the room 40 years later and it's like, whoa, whoa. I mean, she, she was the cheerleader. He was the quarterback. And you're, you're, you, know, you don't say anything publicly, but you're like, wow, man, life's been rough to you. And maybe it has been. Maybe it has. But you know what? We sometimes remember the past through those rose-colored glasses. I've lived through a lot of those days. I thank God for what he's done. They weren't perfect days, but I don't want to live in the good old days. The good days are still ahead of us. Listen, as long as our feet are on the planet, God has good days for us. God has a big plan for our lives. If you're breathing his air and you're walking on his planet, God has something so good for you. I believe that. I hope you're catching this today because I really want to speak into your heart. The good old days, stuck in memory lane, no. The whole context of this portion of scripture, Paul is saying we must forget the past, press to the newer, the greater, because God has greater victories 
and he's got greater glories. Everything you've been through so far, the good, the bad, the ugly, is preparation for greatness. Preparation for greatness. May I say greatness slash servanthood. Servanthood. To serve the Lord God with all your heart and with all your life. The now of Christian living. The now of Christian living. I desire that. I want that. We cannot live in the past. Thank God for what we did in the 70s. Oh, if we just did it this way again. Oh, if we just sang this again. If we just, uh, stop it, stop it, stop it. Please stop it. Let's not miss, in, miss the blessing of today because we're looking back. I guarantee in your car or your truck, you have a big, beautiful windshield and your rear view mirror is about seven and a half inches long. About seven and a half inches long, maybe two, two and a half inches wide. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that because you don't drive through your rear view mirror. You've got this beautiful windshield in front of you. Why? Because God wants you to see the scope. God wants you to see the beauty of what lies ahead of you. You glance back. You glance back. You don't drive back. If you do warn somebody, you're dangerous. We don't, we don't need you on the highways. And so the word of God would speak to our hearts today. And I want that within my own heart. Thank God. Thank God for what he did. I don't want to just teach my children and my grandchildren what God used to do as a church history lesson, as the, what it used to be like. I don't want to live like that. It's not enough to tell them of past blessings. They need a God now. They need a God now. Every generation, every generation has to have their own God moment, has to have their own move of the Holy Spirit where they can see it and look back and see it as a landmark of where God touched their hearts and touched their lives. So please, let's not get stuck on memory lane. The greater the temptation, the older we get. The older we get, I think I can say that now at 63, the older we get, the greater the temptation to look back and not look ahead. The best days are still ahead of us. Hallelujah. Be all you can be. Be all you can be. God can turn your weakness into strengths, your failures into victories, your disappointments into triumphs. It's victory to victories. I say, God, thank you for the memories. Thank you for the memories. But let's go on. So, let's recap. Don't live in the defeats of life. Don't live there. Don't live in the disappointments. Don't live in the mistakes and the sin of your past. Don't live in the hurts of life. And don't live in the past glories and victories. Don't do that. Don't do that. God has more for us than you've ever thought about. He can do it. And I say, thank God. Now, you and I both know, you and I both know that the calendar change and a date and a new year, and, and are not going to bring the changes we really need. See, the calendar doesn't know what you need. It doesn't know what you need. January doesn't know what you need. February doesn't know what you need. God knows what you need. And so the calendars flip, the calendars come, the days come, the weeks come, they come and they go. What we need to do right now is speak to God and say, God, give me an attitude of gratitude. Give me a heart that's open. Keep me teachable. Keep me teachable. Don't let me live in the past. May I forgive easy. May I walk forward, look forward, push forward, press forward to the good things of God. It's really got to be a heart condition and a mind condition, an attitude that we strive to be more like Jesus. I heard uh, this message, not this particular message, but this message that I've crafted today 35 years ago when I was a youth pastor. And I heard similar points that have stuck with me 35 years in family, in life, in ministry, pastoring, now in missionary evangelism. I thank God for these points. I thank God for the word. It's been 35 years and somehow this message that was spoke, was preached by my senior pastor back in the day has really stuck with me over the years about the benefits of God, but some things that we need to let go and let go of now so we can be what God wants us to be today and tomorrow. You notice it's personal to Paul in those three verses, 12, 13, and 14. He uses the word I five times. He doesn't talk about it as we. He's not, he's not taking shots at somebody else. He's just saying, this is my experience. This is where I live. I've not already obtained, verse 12, I've not already obtained all this, but I press on to take hold. Verse 13, I don't count myself yet to have taken hold, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Verse 14, 
I press on towards the goal to win the prize. And that's really my prayer for you and I today and every day as we face challenges, as we face disappointments, as we face defeat, whatever it may be, God has called us to be overcomers. Let's not allow circumstances to dictate our Christianity, but let's allow our Christianity to dictate our circumstances. Father, I pray today that these words would go out with power to speak to our hearts where we live. I pray that our minds would be the minds of Christ. I pray the mind of Christ. I pray that our heart would have, be the heart of Christ. I pray for an open door for our future, an open door in a season of difficulty. We pray that God is still in control. This is a great moment for the church to rise up for we have the answer. The world is hungry for answers. The world is hungry to know truth. And I pray that we'd step up and step out and be everything that what God wants us to be in the present and in the future. We release the past today. We release moments of time. We release people, memories, faces that come to mind as we pray this. We release that today. They will not occupy our future. They will not. Jesus Christ will. I want to be everything that God wants for my life. I pray that today in Jesus' name, amen. Hope you enjoyed today's service. Don't forget that we will be having online service only until further notice. And the church office is now closed and all staff can be reached by email as we work from home during the lockdown. So please take a moment to follow us on social media or email us to be added to our weekly email list to stay up to date. See you online next Sunday, CLC family. Have a great week.